Red Line. Secretary of State John Kerry flew to Moscow to discuss Syria and Ukraine with Russia's President Vladimir Putin following a breakthrough ceasefire agreement on Syria. And this is what we are going to discuss in our second section between the lies analyzing the most thought-provoking publications of the week. In fact, uh, Kerry's visit to Moscow evoked tremendous interest, and we've seen a flurry of reports on the issue. One of them was an article entitled Kerry Off to Russia for Syria Talks After Brussels Attacks, which was written by AP journalist Matthew Lee and carried by the ABC News. The author claims that Obama administration, let me quote, is seeking clarity from Putin and Lavrov as to where Russia stands on a political transition for Syria, particularly on the future of President Bashar. Asset. Major Lee is also addressing the issue of misunderstanding between Moscow and Washington over the basic terms and conditions of implementing ceasefire agreement on Syria. And here is another quote. Russia warned the United States that it will start responding unilaterally to ceasefire violations in Syria if the U.S. refuses to coordinate rules of engagement against uh, violators. So, it's very interesting that the article was written as a preview to the visit, but we've seen that the atmosphere of the visit was surprisingly non-confrontational. Both sides were cooperating, trading jokes, and uh, probably that was a sign that U.S.-Russian relations are back on track. And for more on that, we have in our studio a very special guest, Mr. Fyodor Vaitolovsky, Deputy Director of the Institute of World Economy and International Relations with Russia's Academy on Science. Mr. Vitalovsky, so you, you seen, I was quoting the publication which was written just on the eve of the visit and it was just pointing to the, the bonds of contentions between the US and Russia. But if we look at the visit and we've seen the statements which w were made, it looks that both sides were just trying to make emphasis on the positive agenda. There was no any blame game and uh, President uh, Putin was speaking favorably over President Obama and his role in Syria. On his turn, State Secretary Kerry more than once emphasized important, mm -hmm. crucial role of Russia. So uh, what do we make out of that? I think that uh, Russian-American uh, relations have passed through the lowest point, uh, which uh, I think was somewhere uh, in the middle of uh, 2015. So you brought a good news to the studio. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. I'm very uh, hopeful about it, and I'm very optimist about it, but maybe I'm too much optimist. But anyway, Russian-American relations are coming to the phase uh, which uh, is bringing them from one administration to another. And this process of transit is very significant for the future of uh, Russian-American relations because whoever will be the next president, a Republican or, dem or Democrat, Barack Obama doesn't want to be uh, the person who can be blamed for spoiling uh, the agenda of Russian-American relations and who was uh, unprepared for the troubles and uh, crises which happened after the reset policy, which had a lot of, uh, uh, you know, optimistic estimates uh, and very emotional in its background. But now uh, we have passed through Ukrainian crisis, we have passed through uh, Syrian crisis on its, uh, you know, hot phase, and uh, we also have broader uh, international security agenda. We have the challenge of international terrorism. We have an unpredictable situation on Korean Peninsula and uh, escalation of confrontation there. We have unpredictable and uh, very dangerous situation in Afghanistan and in uh, some parts of uh, Pakistan which can uh, challenge uh, security of uh, Central Asian states. We have uh, uh, very you know, trouble-making situation with flows of migration in Europe. We have uh, Russian-Turkey uh, confrontation on many issues and political misunderstanding. So we have very broad agenda, and each you know point of this agenda, it's, uh, it touches uh, Russian-American relations. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree that the, the visit expanded the agenda of the visit, and uh, initially it was announced that uh, both sides would di discuss Ukraine and Syria only, but after Brussels attacks, obviously there was no way just to, to miss it, to bypass it. But from all that, we have a guest on the line now, Fred Weir, a Moscow correspondent of Christian Science Monitor, who was also watching the visitor and was covering it. Red Line.
I have a feeling that before the visit, there was a lot of tension, and, and, and the press was saying that probably for State Secretary Kerry, this visit would be a sort of a bumpy road. But I was watching the statements which were, were made first by State Secretary Kerry and Foreign Minister Lavrov, then the statements which was made by President Putin. They looked relaxing, they were smiling, they were trading jokes. Do I get it right that both sides are trying to restore that, that atmosphere of confidence and trust which we, we were lacking for, for the last uh, months and, and probably years? I think you're right. The, the mood was less tense than the past, although we, we are watching a process. You know, this is Kerry's third visit in the last, well, less than a year, and uh, that's after a really acrimonious time, you know, when the Americans actually said, don't talk to the Russians at all, to all Europeans and so on. You remember that. So the, the ice has been broken, and we can see perhaps that it's melting. Um, <laughs> But it, it, it's spring now, it's March, so the ice has to melt. <laughs> it's very, yeah. very timely, very timely <laughs> indeed. Uh, but there's a long way to go. I mean, on the Syria stuff, we can see they're getting on the same page, that their interests are aligning, uh, and there must be some element of agreement below the surface that they're not bringing out and showing us. But at the same time, it's not as though it's going gallopingly well. I mean, the, the Geneva talks are still at the stage of talking about talking rather than hard negotiations. There's still a long way to go there. But I was encouraged that, for instance, at least Lavrov said, the Americans have agreed to reopen talks on missile defense. I mean, that is the sort of broadening of the agenda That, that Russia wants. They want to come in from the cold to get back to some kind of business as usual with the Americans, but with Russia being treated respectfully as an equal partner. I believe that is the Russian goal. And so we do seem to be edging closer to it, but we're nowhere near it. Uh, Fred, you, you said that this is the third visit of State Secretary Kerry in probably half a year, and in fact I've heard the, the same thing which is said by many people these days. But I was thinking of uh, that this was also the first visit of State Secretary Kerry to Moscow after uh, both Presidents Obama and Putin has thrown their weight behind uh, the ceasefire agreement in Syria. And, and for me, this is very important. So, And uh, again, if we analyze what was said during the visit, it seems that both sides are trying to capitalize on that, that, that positive agenda which is shaping up all with Syria and trying to expand it. That's what Mr. Vitalovsky was saying. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's certainly on the Russian side where there is a lot of grief over sanctions, over what they view as American uh, disrespecting and misunderstanding Russia. I think there really is a hope that finding this Syria agreement will be like the thin edge of the wedge. It will break open the larger set of issues for, for discussion and reevaluation. I think that's clear on the Russian side. I'm not so sure about the Americans where, you know, first of all, it's, it's the, the last year of Obama's presidency. I think he really doesn't want to deal with Russia. I think he, he's already decided that uh, his legacy will be things like Cuba and the Iran deal. I don't think he wants any big, messy breakthroughs with Russia. And also, the American establishment is faction-ridden. Uh, we see this very clearly in, in, the, in the acrimonious kind of debates that are taking place in the American press. There are a lot of forces that still want to return to a Cold War posture that, because it's so useful in a lot of ways for the American establishment to have that, and there isn't a huge momentum to, for detente or whatever you want to call it with Russia. Yeah, so, so do I get it right that still it's, it's too early to say that there's a demand for day 10 or, or reset, whatever you call it? Yeah, it's, it's way too early. On the other hand, you know, as, as one who, who wishes there wouldn't be a, a, a new Cold War or anything like it, I am encouraged that there are outsider candidates in the presidential uh, race who have totally gone against the old consensus of U.S. foreign policy. I mean, I know an admirer of Donald Trump at all, But this aspect of his foreign policy is extremely interesting, and the fact that he can sell it to even the Republican base is tremendously encouraging. And Bernie Sanders, who isn't likely to get the nomination, but he has changed the conversation in the Democratic Party, and he also is against this, you know, this uh, neoconservative uh, uh, interventionist policies that have dominated 
the Washington consensus for the past couple of decades. Uh, so there is some sign that things in the longer term are going to break open even in the United States. Yeah, Fred, I think that you, you mentioned very important thing that America is changing, American ag agenda is changing, but I hope that you will agree that a lot will depend also on what legacy President Obama will, will leave to his successor, including relations with Russia. But we'll get back to that in our next programs. Thank you for, for being with us, Fred, as always. Thank you. My pleasure. Red line. And now let us see how this visit was perceived in Washington. Now we are joined by Anton Fidyashin, Associate Professor of American University. Uh, Mr. Vidyashin, thank you for coming on the program. How do you interpret this visit? Is it more a casual checkup between the two sides, or do you think that something substantial will come out of it? I think the recent visit of Secretary of State Kerry to Moscow is more of a checkup and a comparison of notes about two unfolding uh, situations. The serious situation where the ceasefire is holding is uh, so fragile that it uh, needs constant contact between the United States and Russia in order to calibrate a system which is always on the verge of uh, disruption. And it's very good that the two sides are talking. The Ukrainian issue uh, revolves around mutual compromises. And uh, it's great that the two sides are uh, talking, but I don't expect any sudden moves or anything surprising to come out of either on the Syria issue or on Ukraine. Mr. Fidyashin, Ukraine and Syria are two of the biggest uh, issues in the world today, and they are the top issues at the agenda of U.S.-Russian relations. To what extent do you think Moscow and Washington would be able to find a compromise? Well, I think that the hope from the Russian side is that there is a possibility of the grand bargain. I don't think that the American side is yet ready to make it. Judging by the commentary from Capitol Hill here in Washington, D.C., the American side will prefer to compartmentalize these two issues, to work with the Russians very constructively on Syria, and then to compensate for that kind of close cooperation to be a lot more firm on the question of Ukraine and to demand more concessions from the southeast of uh, the Ukraine, of uh, the leadership of the Donetsk and the Lugansk Republic, and from the Russians. The Democrats have an election to win, and I think that there is concern within the Democratic Party about appearing too conciliatory and too soft on Moscow because this will taint Hillary Clinton's possibility of winning in November. As you know, previously there was a lot of talk about disagreement, but can you expand a bit on the shared interest that the U.S. and Russia have in both of these crises? I think that the shared interest in uh, Syria is also compartmentalized. The shared interest specifically is about keeping the country together and preventing a total collapse. The difference is, is in how to achieve that. The Russians seem to have prevailed on the United States and its Western partners on abandoning the narrative that Assad must go immediately and then dealing with the situation afterwards. There is still disagreement about how long he will stay, the conditions of the, the move towards a stable peace in Syria and the political future of the country. And I think that those questions were probably what took up most of the time in discussion between Lavrov and Kerry and the, with Putin. On Ukraine, I think the positions are a lot further apart. The, the main question for the Russians is whether the Americans are willing to put enough pressure on the government of Petro Poroshenko to deliver on their side of the Minsk agreements. And the American side is interested in putting pressure on the Russians and through them, the Donetsk and Lugansk uh, People's Republics, to fulfill their side of the agreement. And it looks like neither side wants to make the first move, but both moves will have to be made. Recogn uh, elections and uh, recognition of a special status from Kiev side, and then uh, the control over the border from the side of Donetsk and Lugansk. And now we are running out of time, and uh, we have to wrap up this section of Red Line, so let me thank uh, uh, all our guests participating, beginning with our studio guests, Mr. Fyodor Wojtolowski, Deputy Director of the Institute of World Economy and International Relations with Russian Economy of Sciences, and uh, Fred uh, Weir, uh, Special Correspondent with Christian Science Monitor, and Anton Fedyashin, Professor of History with uh, American University based in Washington.
Following on our program, we have Barack Obama setting foot in the Cuban no-go zone. Stay with us.